Well, hello there. Welcome to another beautiful day here at the University of Alabama. Every day is beautiful in Tuscaloosa, uh, as you well know. Uh, I apologize for having to do this lecture uh, by video, uh, but I have some very important meetings going on uh, today uh, that prevent me from being available to uh, give the regular Skype lecture. So this gives you a little more freedom to uh, watch the lecture in your time over the weekend. Um, today we're going to uh, sort of move ahead from uh, the 1948 campaign in which Harry Truman had that incredible uh, comeback uh, election victory against Dewey. Uh, we talked about um, how Truman was able to pull that off uh, in the ways that political polling had not anticipated uh, particular voters actions the way uh, that uh, they thought they could and the impact that had uh, moving forward on how we uh, try and predict these things. Today I want to talk about uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, today's lecture is entitled The Most Famous Man in America. Oh, and by the way, I apologize for uh, being dressed down, but it's uh, currently well after midnight, uh, so uh, this is the best you get uh, when uh, I'm working late. <clears throat> the most famous man in America, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. As you may be familiar, uh, one of the popular button slogans for uh, the Eisenhower campaign in both 52 and 56 was I like Ike or we like Ike. Um, the question coming out of um, the election of 1948 was uh, not whether I like Ike or we like Ike or the people liked Ike. The question was who does Ike like? So point number one, who does Ike like? Well, um, first let's understand a little bit about Dwight Eisenhower um, and see that his, both his upbringing and his military experience help, uh, help him in many ways prepare uh, for the presidency. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was born in 1890 in Texas. Uh, his family shortly thereafter moved to a small home in uh, Abilene, Kansas, where he was raised. Uh, his parents were God-fearing people, and ironically, they were pacifist, uh, which means they uh, did not um, believe in uh, engaging in warfare. Uh, nonetheless, Dwight Eisenhower, after finishing school, was admitted to West Point, uh, where he received his military training and graduated in 1915. Now, Eisenhower was not known particularly for his, um, for his skill in the classroom at this point. Uh, he finished 61st uh, in his class of 164. Um, and he was better known for his performance on the football field than he was uh, for his academics at this point. He did not serve in World War I like uh, one of his classmates, uh, John, uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur, um, but instead was stationed in Panama under the command of General Fox Connor. Now, um, Connor liked Eisenhower a lot. Uh, found him to be a very friendly and a very capable um, uh, assistant. Uh, he encouraged Ike to uh, read more broadly than uh, he typically had in his past, uh, get into military history, um, and even read, pick up and read uh, classical literature. Uh, he believed this was uh, very important uh, to, to be a well-rounded, uh, thoughtful, perceptive leader. Um, <clears throat> after several years together, Connor recommended Ike for the Army's elite command and general staff school, 
uh, at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. Um, Eisenhower went back to the States to attend and uh, upon finishing the program uh, he graduated first in his class there of 275 and at this point Eisenhower is really starting to stand out as uh, one of the up-and-coming um, kind of star uh, uh, young commanders, young officials in uh, the US Army. Now um, after uh, his time at Fort Leavenworth, he'd sh serve a short stint in the office of the Assistant Secretary of the War, uh, or Assistant Secretary of War. Uh, we now call it the Secretary of Defense that changes after World War II. Um, and after this, he was assigned for um, the remainder of the 1930s uh, to work as the um, basically as the top assistant to General Douglas MacArthur, uh, both in Washington in the first half of the 30s and then uh, in the latter half uh, he would travel to the Philippines with uh, MacArthur uh, and work with him there. Of course, MacArthur basically drove Eisenhower crazy. Uh, MacArthur is uh, if you don't know much about MacArthur, you should uh, you should read more into him, um, or read more about him. A uh, great book uh, is by a now deceased historian William Manchester, uh, who called uh, Douglas MacArthur the American Caesar. Um, so check that out if you're interested more in Douglas MacArthur. But uh, just to um, kind of give you some some frame of reference on him. He is um, he um, if if MacArthur were alive today, he would be the selfie general. Uh, not because you know he um, likes taking pictures of himself or things. Well, he does he he does like other people taking pictures of himself. Um, he, I, uh, MacArthur was just a really um, uh, self-focused, self-promoting, uh, grandiose sort of drama queen of a general. Um, and he loved the production, he loved the attention, and, uh, and that tended to drive Eisenhower nuts. Um, and we see see this in in some of Eisenhower's personal papers, um, uh, but nonetheless he did his duty and and um, uh, served uh, worked his job. Now during this time, much of what Eisenhower was doing was uh, researching and writing speeches uh, for MacArthur, and also working on position papers. So we see here Eisenhower working to develop uh, his his skills both um, in it, sort of finding finding ways to sharpen and deliver a message clearly uh, but also finding ways to diplomatically approach complicated uh, positions. After Pearl Harbor uh, we find that Eisenhower was reassigned to the planning division of the War Department uh, while he was there, he um, really impressed the Army's Chief of Staff, uh, who at the time was George Marshall. Uh, you might have heard of him because of uh, the later Marshall Plan that uh, was uh, that, that enormous aid package to Western Europe following World War II. It was such an important part of President Truman's containment plan when it came to dealing with uh, communism. Marshall was so impressed that when it came time um, in the midst of the Allied effort in, in Europe in World War II, when it came time to select a commander uh, to lead the Allied forces, um, he picked Eisenhower over a number of other um, higher ranking, more senior generals. Uh, and so Eisenhower kind of uh, rockets to the top um, and becomes supreme allied commander of the forces in Europe. 
Uh, of course, uh, he makes his name in the U.S. and around the world uh, as a war hero uh, because of his successful execution of the D-Day landing, um, which occurred on June 6, 1944. <clears throat> After the war, uh, he returns home a hero. Uh, he's celebrated, he's beloved, he's uh, well-liked, um, he's given parades and, um, and speaking opportunities and um, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of attention upon his return home. Um, af after returning home, he would be appointed Army Chief of Staff to replace his um, old boss, George Marshall. Uh, then he would um, leave Washington to become president of Columbia University in 1948. And then finally in 1951, um, he would take on the role as uh, commander of the NATO forces in Europe. Um, he would serve in that role for um, 51 and, and um, in midway through 52. Now, as early as the 1948 election, and get this, both parties, both Democrats and Republicans, actively pursued Eisenhower for their candidate as president, or for their candidate for uh, president of the United States. Um, remember, uh, well into the election of 19, or well into the election campaign of 1948, Democrats were not particularly fond of Harry Truman because Truman was really struggling to hold together um, the different factions of the party. Remember his uh, challenge on the left from Henry Wallace, his challenge on the right uh, from the Dixiecrats. Uh, so the Democrats were very interested, if Eisenhower had been interested, in getting someone who could be popular, who could unite people, um, and who could give them um, an almost assured victory uh, in, in November. Um, now, equally as willing to ditch their candidate uh, were the Republicans. Uh, now, of course, they liked Thomas Dewey, uh, but the reality was Thomas Dewey himself might have even been likely to uh, step aside to uh, to allow someone the likes of uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, to uh, carry the party to victory in November. So both parties are pushing, pressing, asking, uh, sending their top officials to visit Eisenhower um, up at Columbia. Um, ultimately, uh, Eisenhower... Uh, kind of shrugs off uh, both, uh, both groups uh, and, and uh, doesn't commit either way, okay? Now, Thomas Dewey's unexpected defeat in the election of 1948 doesn't do anything to calm down this agitation towards Eisenhower. In fact, it makes it worse and we see as early as 1949 uh, that uh, Thomas Dewey himself is regularly visiting and contacting Dwight Eisenhower and pleading with him uh, to, um, to pursue the Republican nomination uh, for president in the 1952 election coming up. Um, Now, a big part of the reason why everyone wanted Eisenhower as their presidential candidate um, had to do with the fact that Eisenhower, as the title of this lecture suggests, was the most famous man in America following uh, the success of D-Day and the end of World War II uh, the following year. Um, <clears throat> Understand that, in part, this is driven by the enormous number of uh, military veterans who return home 
uh, who are now going to be voters and very prominent voices in uh, in the vote. They're they're men. Uh, they're predominantly white, uh, and they are in uh, one of within those major demographics that uh, that. Uh, political parties are trying to uh, tap into uh, for the election. Um, also understand that um, with the end of the uh, uh, the end of World War II, Dwight Eisenhower from uh, from the mid 1940s until his death in 1969. So over the course of about 25 years, uh, would consistently be one of uh, Gallup Poll's most famous men in America. Uh, and almost half of those 25 years, he was um, voted number one most famous man in America. So over and over and over again, uh, long after he's out of office, for a decade after he's out of office, he is one of the most uh, famous, most well-respected, well-liked people in America. Um, now, the, the reason that both um, political parties continued to pursue Eisenhower uh, well into 1952 uh, was that as a military officer, Eisenhower had never registered uh, for either party. And he claimed that he'd also never voted. Uh, because he didn't want that influencing or shading uh, his uh, military leadership in any way, uh, if the, if that were to uh, to get out. So um, so Eisenhower had no public affiliation with either party. Okay, um, all of his important assignments uh, in the military had been under Democratic presidents. He strongly supported Harry Truman's Cold War containment policies and was a strong component of the Korean War, which began uh, during uh, Truman's second term in the summer of 1950 okay? uh, and involved NATO troops, uh, which of course uh, would uh, directly affect Dwight Eisenhower in his position as uh, commander of NATO forces after 1951. Um, but uh, where he he supported Democrat posi democratic positions um, in uh, foreign policy um, on domestic issues, Eisenhower was oftentimes uh, much more conservative, very conservative. Um, he believed passionately that the country needed to prioritize a balanced budget um, and that it needed to limit government intervention in the social and economic lives of its citizens. Okay, so this is um, going to get Eisenhower into some hot water, especially with historians, uh, when the issue of civil rights begins emerging um, nationally, uh, especially after the um, the two decisions in uh, Supreme Court decisions in Brown versus the Board of Education of uh, Topeka, Kansas, in 1954 and 1955. Um, in reality, Eisenhower was never even considering running as a Democrat. Eisenhower was not a Democrat, um, but he had such a good poker face and was so dedicated to uh, not um, staking out a political position while he was a military commander uh, that the, Dem the Democrats held out hope all the way until um, the first primary of, uh, of the 1952 election cycle, which would have been in February 1952. Um, now, while the Democrats didn't actually have a chance, the, that didn't mean that the Republicans just automatically got Eisenhower. Um, in fact, the GOP still had uh, much work to do to convince Eisenhower uh, that uh, he needed to run for president. So, 
Uh, moving now to point number two, uh, winning over the winning candidate. Winning over the winning candidate. Okay? It's one thing to know a winner. It's another. It's it's uh, one thing to be uh, liked by the winner. But if you can't get the winner to play on your team, uh, what good does it do you? So um, after 1948, as we suggested, Republicans were desperate to get Eisenhower. Uh, to to run because because understand uh, they've experienced um, four terms of FDR domination and then FDR's incumbent who is some guy that most people hadn't even known when he became president has now surprisingly defeated uh, their candidate the Republicans were desperate to find somebody that could be an attractive face for their policies, for their plan. Um, so um, Eisenhower seemed like the most likely promising uh, candidate if they could get him. So in early 1949, um, only months after the shocking defeat in, in 48, Thomas Dewey, who was still governor of New York, um, uh, since he wasn't elected president, began regularly badgering Eisenhower to run. Um, in w one meeting in 1949, he told Eisenhower, uh, according to Ike, that uh, Eisenhower could, quote, save the country from going to Hades in the handbasket of paternalism, socialism, and dictatorship. Okay, so to put it in really light terms there, paternalism, socialism, and dictatorship. Paternalism, that's an interesting term that you don't always hear associated with the Democrats today, but maybe uh, we should uh, give it some thought. Um, now, by late 1951, uh, Dewey, as well as leading uh, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts, who we'll see was uh, later um, uh, Nixon's running mate in 1960, um, and other leading Republicans uh, are going to begin developing um, uh, a national uh, finance and political support network uh, to try and nominate Eisenhower uh, for the presidency. Even though Eisenhower is still staying out of this, he's still not uh, announcing which way he leans politically or anything like that. Now understand, the, the uh, Republicans that are after Eisenhower in particular are uh, the more progressive, um, we might say liberal, um, or, or, or moderate centrist um, Eastern internationalist wing of the Republican Party. Okay, today these would be seen kind of as the um, as the establishment Republicans, right? Uh, even though um, esta most establishment Republicans today are more conservative than these establishment Republicans back in the 1950s. Um, so understand that there's a difference, but this is sort of the, the centrist left side of uh, the Republican Party uh, that's after Eisenhower. Um, now, Eisenhower, as we've already mentioned, um, by 1951 is in Europe serving NATO. Uh, so he's able to largely avoid um, the advances of Dewey and Lodge and these other um, uh, important Republicans until early 1952. Now, as the primary season approached, Eisenhower finally relents and allows his name to be placed on the ballot in New Hampshire um, as a Republican uh, for uh, the primary to be held actually in March 1952, not in February, in March 1952. And without leaving Europe or 
taking any public position on any of the major campaign issues. Eisenhower won the primary in New Hampshire uh, with 46,661 votes to uh, the 35,838 votes of Senator Robert Taft of Ohio. Now, Taft is a really important figure here. Um, he was the leader of the Midwestern isolationist um, conservative old guard of the Republican Party, and he's also the son of the former president, uh, William Howard Taft, okay, who had been um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's sort of disappointing successor uh, and a progressive. Um, so it's ironic, his dad was a progressive, but he's a, a staunch conservative. Um, all right, um, now that we're talking about uh, Robert Taft uh, is important because uh, what we find is that actually Robert Taft held the key um, to whether or not Eisenhower uh, actually would ever run for president or not. Um, so let's go to point number three. Point number three, why Eisenhower almost never ran. Why Eisenhower almost never ran uh, for presidency. There had actually been a moment when Eisenhower considered totally bowing out of not just the presidential election of 1952, but politics altogether. Okay. Um, he almost never got started, and it all revolved around Robert Taft. Robert Taft was, uh, was at the pivot point um, of Eisenhower's political career. Um, not long after Eisenhower had taken uh, the NATO position in 1951, President Truman had invited him back to Washington to brief Congress uh, about the situation in Europe and about the importance of what they called collective security with Western Europe. The importance of these inter staying involved in the international uh, uh, community in order to um, uh, in order to continue rebuilding Western Europe so that it could stand against the spread of communism that they believed was coming, and uh, to encourage and promote and strengthen and spread freedom, democracy, um, and all these ideals uh, uh, further around the globe. Understand that Americans at this time and American leaders saw World War II in many ways as a consequence, a direct consequence even, of the U.S.'s disengagement from the world after World War I. So while Eisenhower was back home um, to address Congress, he decided to reach out to um, Senator Robert Taft uh, for a meeting to discuss this issue of U.S. involvement in NATO and this collective security agreement. Um, because Taft had been a very vocal um, uh, um, opposition to um, this, this whole idea. Taft, unlike um, many other Republicans um, in, or some other Republicans in uh, World War II uh, who became internationalist, uh, Taft had remained isolationist like, um, like the old party had been. Uh, and this is why they received that nickname of the Old Guard. Um, so Taft is uh, is a prominent voice. In fact, people at the time called him Mr. Republican. Uh, he was in many ways the face of the Republican Party uh, up to this point, and, um, and many believed he would be the hands-on favorite to win the nomination in 1952 uh, if a more famous opponent did not enter the race. Uh, so Eisenhower uh, contacts Taft, says, I'd like to meet with you to talk about NATO. Taft 
promptly replied and said uh, he would love, be glad to uh, discuss it with Eisenhower. But he asked that the meeting not take place at, uh, at the uh, Senate building, rather uh, that uh, they meet secretly at Eisenhower's office in the Pentagon. Um, now, writing later, Eisenhower would say that uh, this, this whole development, uh, Taft's happy response, um, was encouraging. Thought, uh, thought that perhaps they could uh, uh, reach some sort of understanding over this uh, issue of uh, involvement in uh, NATO. So, after securing the meeting, Ike called in uh, two of his staff uh, staff officers, his two top assistants, and had them help him to draft a letter uh, that would be issued that evening following his meeting with Taft if Taft agreed to support NATO. And here's what uh, Eisenhower said about this letter. He said, quote, My statement was so strong that if made public, any political future for me thereafter would be impossible. Okay? So this statement made really, really clear that Eisenhower was out, uh, would never be involved in politics. Uh, he was not a candidate, nor would he ever be a candidate. Uh, he was uh, a military general, and that's uh, how he would finish his career. Now, once Eisenhower, the meticulous editor, uh, was finished and satisfied with the wording of the letter, um, he tells us that he folded it up and slipped it inside the interior pocket of his coat uh, and prepared for the meeting. Okay, so uh, the, the uh, letter is going to remain right there in, in his uh, chest pocket uh, throughout this meeting. Now, uh, when Taft arrived, he entered the Pentagon through a seldom used, sort of out of the way entrance uh, into the building. And he was met there and ushered um, into the bowels of uh, the enormous uh, Pentagon down to Eisenhower's private office. <clears throat> um, the two men met for quite a long time. Eisenhower called it a long talk. Um, but the whole of the meeting boiled down to uh, one question uh, that Ike had for Taft. Uh, and he says his question was this, Would you and your associates in the Congress agree that collective security is necessary for us in Western Europe? And will you support this idea as a bipartisan policy? Now, Ike made clear to Taft that if Taft were to answer yes, then Eisenhower would be perfectly happy in his new position in Europe and would go about the business of, of sort of managing this new responsibility, helping to get NATO off the ground and, and um, maintaining security and containment of communism um, in Eastern Europe. But... Eisenhower also made clear that if Taft responded no, that he could not support uh, a bipartisan agreement on NATO, uh, that Eisenhower um, would likely be coming back to the United States. Okay. Um, so, Throughout this meeting, Eisenhower struggled with all his persuasive might, he tells us, uh, to, to try and convince Taft uh, to get on board with the plan, uh, to make some sort of commitment, some sort of indication uh, that he would be willing uh, to negotiate, to get on board with this plan for um, uh, international involvement in collective security. Uh, but again and again, Taft dodged the question. He never would commit to a firm answer uh, on this question. Um, he was playing politics. And so while Eisenhower called this a friendly meeting, um, he also writes that it, quote, aroused my fears that isolationism was stronger in the Congress than I had previously suspected. 
And so after the long meeting was complete and Eisenhower and Taft said their uh, polite, friendly uh, farewells, um, as, Eisen as Taft uh, was ushered out of, the, out of the building, Eisenhower called back in those same two assistants from earlier uh, and had them witness as he removed the letter from his chest pocket, shredded it into pieces, and threw it into the trash. Eisenhower wouldn't be staying in Europe. Um, as we know, Eisenhower would be coming back home because Eisenhower believed uh, that he had a much more important job to do uh, than to remain at the head of NATO. Uh, because Ike feared um, not only the potential for the election of another Democratic president um, who uh, might not take seriously um, his, his concerns about uh, balanced budgets, um, he also feared perhaps even more, uh, the nomination of someone like Robert Taft, who would return uh, one of the major parties to isolationism and, um, and drastically affect uh, the U.S.'s uh, position in the world and uh, the potential future stability of uh, the global peace secured uh, after the Second World War. Um, Eisenhower was not willing uh, to allow that to happen, and so Eisenhower came back home primarily uh, to face off uh, Robert Taft and the Midwestern conservatives uh, for the Republican nomination. And um, so with that, we will uh, leave it there. Eisenhower's shredded letter in the trash and political future uh, on the ropes and we'll come back uh, next week uh, for our regularly scheduled lecture on Monday uh, to uh, to talk about Eisenhower as um, the media savvy television uh, president of the 1950s okay uh, so um, Come back, you won't want to miss this.